World War II, the atomic bomb was a question unanswered, a fear for both sides and all people, the beginning of a new era of war and the end of another. To allow an enemy to be secure at all points is to be unprepared for them. The tools needed to pick apart the groundwork elements can deprive the other side of the oxygen needed for resilience. Then, when they are breathless and frail, you come out of the umbrage and strike. During the years of Nazi Germany occupied Norway, the Nazis had control of the Vimork hydroelectric plant outside of Ryukan. The plant had been originally designed by Leif Tronstad, a young Norwegian chemistry professor, to use mountain water for electrolysis, which produced ammonia for nitrogen fertilizer. Under Nazi control, in 1933, Leif had repurposed the structure into an innovative heavy water plant. But for what purpose? Heavy water, also known as deuterium oxide, is 10.6% denser than ordinary water due to presence of the heavier hydrogen isotope. There is nothing heavy water can't do that ordinary water can. In fact, the human eye can barely tell them apart. A method used to detect the difference demonstrates that ice cubes made from heavy water sink rather than float in a glass of tap water. The Germans had discovered that with the different nuclear properties in the water, it could be used to turn common uranium into plutonium. When fast neutrons released by the splitting of atoms, that is nuclear fission, pass through heavy water, interactions with the heavy water molecules cause those neutrons to slow down or moderate. Slower moving neutrons are far more efficient at splitting uranium atoms, therefore less uranium is needed to achieve a critical mass. The minimum amount of uranium required to start a spontaneous chain reaction of atoms splitting in rapid succession in other words, the explosive energy of the nuclear bomb. The Germans planned to artificially produce all the heavy water that they needed, threatening the engineers at Vimork with death if they didn't maximize production. By January 1935, the plant has produced a staggering 100 grams of heavy water. So much work for so little. The significance of this amount becomes clear when considering the ratio of existing heavy water to ordinary water is about 1 to 41 million molecules. During this period, the Norwegian campaign was actively resisting the Nazi invasion of northern Norway, but had given up. The Norwegian government and the royal family were evacuated. Plant designer Leif Tronstad made a decision to spy on the activity at Vemork. For months, he obtained information and anonymously corresponded with the British. The British intelligence were now aware of the Germans' desire to increase the plant's production of heavy water even more during the summer of 1941. When the Gestapo, Nazi Germany's secret police, found out about Tronstad's underground work, he fled to Sweden and then to Britain, where he revealed himself to be the source of the intelligence on the Vemork plant. Tronstad was prevented from joining the field teams, but because of his knowledge of the plant, he was instead appointed the leader for training commando units to sabotage operations. He said in quote to the soldiers, I cannot tell you why this mission is so important, but if you succeed, it will live in Norway's memory for a hundred years. The attempt to undermine Nazi nuclear ambitions was now underway. In 1942, the Manhattan Project was launched. It was a plan to race the Germans to build the atomic bomb. Now that the Allies knew what Nazi Germany was planning, they had to make attempts to cripple the research and development while their own progress surpassed. Initially, the Americans wanted to destroy the Vemok plant using bombers. Tronstad warned against the method, vocalizing that Vemork was a natural fortress. The plant was surrounded by the Hard Anger Vida, a high mountain plateau near the heavily populated town of Ryukan. The collateral damage would be too excessive on the civilians. Moreover, the plant was housed in steel and concrete, with the heavy water facility in the basement of the structure. Would the bombs be enough to reach production? It was decided that the fortress would need to be attacked from the inside, the British had the Special Operations Executive, trained operatives for covert sabotage missions. The Norwegian branch of the Special Operations Executive was known as Company Ling. This branch recruited Norwegians who fled to England following Germany's invasion of Norway. Operatives completed gruelling training in Scotland that featured climbing mountains, fording rivers and outdoor camping for weeks. In late 1942, the first attempt to infiltrate the Vimork plant began with Operation Grouse and Operation Freshman. In March, the British Special Operations Executive recruited Einar Skinnerland, 
a Norwegian engineer who had several contacts within the Vemork plant. He was able to identify the complexity of the German troops and their defences. The British began intensive training of a four-man Norwegian agent team, codenamed Operation Grouse. They were trained in sabotage, radio transmitting and irregular warfare, which taught them how to fight larger groups as a minority. By October, the Grouse team was ready to embark. The team landed at Fjarefet on the Hardanger Vida and spent 15 days trekking to Mosvatn, where they met with Skinnerland's brother, Torstein. With the help of Torstein, they established contact to London, and the next phase of the plan was ready. British commandos were preparing to arrive three miles southwest of Mosvatn Dam. They planned to send two horse gliders each with 17 commandos on board. The first glider, carried by a Halifax bomber, was unable to pick up a transponder signal causing the crew to have to locate the landing zone with a map in harsh weather. Ice began to form on the glider causing the towing rope to snap. The glider then crashed into a land called Filiusdal where three men died and the remaining 14 were captured, jailed, tortured and killed. The second glider and bomber combo met even harsher weather. The pilot of the bomber released the glider and crashed into a mountain killing everyone on board. The released glider spiralled and crashed as well, causing both of the pilots to be killed instantly. The commandos survived but were injured at varying degrees. Two of the British soldiers left the crash site to seek help. They arrived at a hamlet of Helland two miles away and informed locals of the crash. The locals knew of a doctor, but he was another nine miles up the road and they would need to use a phone to contact him. But it would not be so simple as the Germans controlled the telephone system the soldiers agreed to use the phone, alerting the Germans, thinking they would simply be taken as prisoners of war. When the Germans found sabotage equipment, all of the remaining British soldiers were executed. The Grouse team remained unidentified and with limited supplies, were forced to live off the land and hunt wild reindeer. The group renamed themselves Swallow. Months passed and Norwegians developed an alternate strategy it would be called Operation Gunnerside. They'd parachute a small group of six expert skiers into the wilderness that surrounded the plant. The lightly armed skiers would then quickly ski their way to the plant and use stealth, rather than force, to gain entry to the heavy water production room in order to destroy it with explosives. Led by Joachim Ronneberg, the group jumped from a plane under the cover of snowfall at around midnight on February 16, 1943. The commandos dressed as ghosts in all white camouflage. Under the camo, they wore British uniform, so that if they were caught, the British would be blamed and the Norwegian locals would face less repercussions. Once landed, they travelled five days to meet with the four members of Swallow. Both teams waited out the weather and made rapid progress toward their target across the countryside. Late evening on February 27, 1943, nine of the men began the raid on the Vimork plant. They were armed with submachine guns, grenades, pistols and knives, hoping to only have to use the explosives they brought for the sabotage. There were only three ways to access the plant. The first was to come down from the mountains above the plant. Intelligence informed that the area was covered in mines. The second route was directly across a heavily guarded single-lane suspension bridge, an unwise route. The third and last option was to travel to the bottom of the gorge, cross a half-frozen river and climb a 500-foot high cliff. The group had no choice but to take this route. When the sky grew dark, the men descended to the bottom of the ravine, crossed the stream, and scaled the steep cliffs to the plant. To get through the plant's side gate fence, they used a pair of heavy-duty metal cutters brought by the leader Ronneberg. Luckily, Ronneberg had bought these cutters in England after a movie on his day off. Without the cutters, the sabotage may have failed. They split into two groups, a four-man explosive team and a five-man cover squad. Once in the building, Ronneberg and his men placed two strings of explosive charges next to the heavy water production cells. In order to provide enough time to escape but still hear the explosion, he shortened the fuse to just 30 seconds. The men fled the plant, backtracked through the ravine, reconnected with the cover squad and began to ski toward Rukan. From there, they travelled over 200 miles to Sweden on the skis. The Germans sent out a search and pursuit of the commandos, but none of the members were captured or killed. Not a single shot was fired by either side. 
Germans were later able to rebuild their plant and resume making heavy water, but the bombing effort had slowed production to the point that an atomic bomb would not finish in time to influence the outcome of the war. On November 16, 1943, 140 American bombers flew over Ryukan and bombed the Vimok plant after it was rebuilt, but it did little to nothing, as expected by the Norwegians. The Germans eventually decided to cease production. They did not have the people, the cooperation among those they did have, and they did not have the money or labs. Germany today is officially an undeclared nuclear state as promised when West Germany became a member of NATO. Even though it is now clear that the German nuclear program was far from successful, it was an impetus for the Manhattan Project, which led to the development of the first atomic bombs, the Fat Man and the Little Boy. The atomic bomb was an odious phantom blooming in the dawn of the sky, and when the day the melting of solids comes, it could silence poetry for a thousand years. That is all for this video. Thank you for watching. Like and comment videos you want to see and subscribe to keep the story alive.